making a great product, they have a very high valuation and they will experience uh, all the automakers coming in and competing with them. And so it's not like some tech markets that the leader gets all that uh, market share. It's going to be a tougher thing. The, the move to autonomous and electric are proceeding in parallel. And if you take a 15-year you know, time frame, it's going to be a very, very dramatic change. Uh, you know, I tend to be optimistic about technology adoption. Uh, and I think worldwide, well, there's a lot of cities that want to be the first to get in with these cheap autonomous services. So uh, it's exciting. And the other car companies now have been forced to have strategies for electric cars and autonomous. Uh, some have very impressive plans. Are there lower insurance? What, what does? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to say, are there lower insurance rates? Talking about thinking about Geico for a Tesla or for the new Cadillac that has uh, some kind of uh, semi-autonomous driving. You know, some of these new features that that allow the computer to drive a little bit more than the human. Yeah, the <clears throat> presumably any cars that catch on big are going to be safer, and a safer car is going to bring lower insurance rates. There's one some uh, there's a, there's a mo modest offset to that in that. In terms of <clears throat> uh, collision activity, uh, the damage is done to a car by, in terms of a bumper or a a, uh, uh, a side uh, rearview mirror or something, uh, uh, costs far more. Now it, it's a much more complex product. So the damage per accident, not human damage, but physical damage to the car, that will probably go up substantially. But the number of accidents won't. You won't see widespread adoption unless they're safer, and 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 they should, we, we want a safer car. Uh, so it's net, it will be bad for the auto insurance industry over time if autonomous cars become uh, a big part of the fleet. Bill just mentioned that over the next 15 years, you are going to see some pretty significant changes. Oh, yeah. Is that the the time frame that Geico is looking at that too? Well, it's, <clears throat> we don't know. I mean, what it'll be and. You've got 260 million cars on, on the road. Let's just say that 10 percent of the people took up autonomous cars in a year. Now you're talking about a, a million eight out of the 18 million. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a big life cycle to it and all of that. But what does best for the consumer and is safer over time and everything will prevail uh, over time. It, uh, and that's good for the American public. Uh, it's very hard to tell who the winner will be, though. Or there, there won't. It, it's, it was hard under the conventional car to pick out which would be the, the, the company that was doing the best 10 years earlier. That's why Charlie and I have talked about the auto industry for, forever. So I, it's very hard to pick winners. And it'll be hard to pick winners five years from now. Nobody's going to own the market or anything of the sort. I am amazed at how good almost all the cars are. With all those servo mechanisms and all that electricity scattered through, you can buy a car and drive it 10 years with practically no trouble. It's an amazing achievement. I mean, you, you were big on the electric vehicles, too, with BYD. Well, you got to remember, in China, you couldn't believe, breathe the air in the cities. Mm -hmm. So I thought they might end up with more electric cars. It wasn't a very difficult idea. Let's talk a little bit about Berkshire overall and some of the changes that we've seen this year. Uh, Ajit Jain and Greg Abel named as uh, co-vice chairman along with Cherry and with Charlie on this. How has it changed your day-to-day -day life, Warren? Well, not a lot, but it's made it e easier. It was already easy to start with. I mean, uh, but uh, <laughs> the I mean, really easy. But the five percent that I didn't like. I just said, oh, those are your <laughs> responsibilities. That's the way I selected what their responsibilities would be. <laughs> and uh, it, well, Charlie can tell you, it, it, it's changed our lives very little, but all for the better. It's been, tr it's been very, very good for Berkshire, and it's been even better for me. Charlie, you were a proponent of this. I think it was your idea uh, to name them vice chairman. Well, it's hardly, you can hardly find two people who've done better in their jobs in all of America. It's very outstanding people. The truth is, we were too late. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I know succession is a, a common or constant uh, topic with the rest of the board members. Um, what does the board think about this, about the, these positionings? And now that they're both board members, too, what does that mean just from board's perspective? Well, it's exciting to have 
two you know, highly energetic, super capable people helping out Warren uh, and now as, as board members. I've gotten to know both of them uh, for over 10 years, and I'm just amazed at uh, what they, they bring. Uh, they understand the Berkshire culture because they've been inside it and have benefited from it. Uh, so it's, it's great news. There are people who are wondering if this was creating a horse race for a successor. I heard Ron Olson's uh, knocking down that idea over the weekend. How, how would you respond to that? No, it's, it's not a horse race <laughs> for uh, being the successor. That's, that's not a good way to characterize it. What is the right way to characterize it? Uh, that uh, the number of businesses that report to Warren uh, is a pretty unbelievable number. And so now I've gone from one person with all those businesses reporting to him to three people. Um, so the company's not adding, you know, a lot of staff, you know, under Greg and under Ajit. You just have three great business minds uh, managing, you know, over 50 uh, business entities. So it's still one of the leanest <laughs> management <laughs> structures you've ever seen. If you draw it out as an org chart, you have to have one of the whitest pieces of paper ever, <laughs> even with the three now. Uh, so, uh, you know, Berkshire's still very, very unique. All right. Folks, we are going to have more of this conversation with Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Bill Gates. We will be back with more from Omaha, Nebraska, right after this. Welcome back to a special edition of Squawk Box. We are live from Omaha, Nebraska, and we are joined this morning by Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft and a Berkshire board member, Charlie Munger, who's the vice chair of Berkshire Hathaway, and Warren Buffett, who is the chairman and CEO of Berkshire. And gentlemen, the last half hour, we've kind of been delving through your thoughts on the markets, on technology, on privacy issues, on Bitcoin. I thought we might take this next half hour and, and, and go a little broader, because all three of you have big ideas about the world and how to fix it. You have spent a considerable amount of money uh, and time on philanthropic projects, on trying to find ways to move beyond. And you all happen to know a lot about so many different things. Uh, one of the issues that's been so much in the headlines over the last six months or so has been Berkshire's move to go along with J.P. Morgan and Amazon to try and come up with a way to rein in health care costs and health care cost inflation in the United States. Warren, we've talked with you about this, but we haven't gotten the chance to talk with Bill and Charlie so much about this. And for those who don't know it, by the way, Charlie, for the last 31 years, has been the chairman of the board at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles, so he knows an awful lot about health care. Uh, Bill Gates has worked tirelessly when it comes to health care issues around the globe. In fact, the Gates Foundation has invested $12 billion in global health initiatives just over the last five years. So for anybody who's wondering about your credentials on this, <laughs> there they are. Um, why don't we start with you, Bill? What, what do you think about the idea of trying to tackle health care cost inflation and, and how that might be uh, tackled in the United States? Is this something that could get traction? Well, I think other than improving the education system, uh, making sure the health care costs don't continue to go up so rapidly is the, the biggest issue. Uh, if you look at state governments, over time they've had to shift money away from education and infrastructure into the various uh, health care expenses they have. And so uh, it's a problem uh, for the government, it's a problem for business. So any effort to take a look at this system and how we use the latest technology to make it more efficient, uh, to reward the low-cost providers uh, so that they gain market share, uh, I think that's fantastic. I've studied it a lot, and I don't think it's it's an easy uh, thing to fix, but it's, it's fantastic that the three companies are going to work together. Uh, to the degree they succeed, there are hundreds of companies that would love to uh, join in, but first uh, they've got to hire some people and it's got to come into focus. Charlie, let, let's just talk about how fixable you think this problem is. Do you see a lot of rampant waste uh, when it comes to these issues, at, at least from your perspective at the hospital? Rampant waste is a good phrase, of course. Well, our system is shot through with ra rampant waste, and a lot of the medical care we do deliver is wrong. And so expensive and wrong is, 
is ridiculous. A lot of our medical providers artificially prolong death so they can make more money. I regard that as deeply immoral, and there's a lot of it. And so I think the first time the Democrats control all three branches of government, we will get single-payer medicine. I think it's so bad that people will, will reach out for a, a complete change forced by the government. To have a young person have a $5,000 deductible when he has a baby, that's not insurance anymore. It's, a, it's, it's some stratagem to make things better for some insurance company, but it's not really medical insurance. It's, this whole system is shot through with, with defects, and of course I welcome the fact that Berkshire is trying to make it a, a little better in some ways. If you could fix it, how, how would you go about doing it? Are there maybe not easy ways, but are there obvious ways? Of, of trying it's to very that. hard to get to a system like Singapore's, which costs about 20% of what our system does and works better from where we are now. We will never get there, in my opinion, in a big, rich nation like ours. But we can have a better system than we have now. Would universal health care be the answer? You said you think that's Well, what there are happen. many defects in universal health care, but universal health care with an opt-out, which they have in all the advanced nations, England, Canada, and so forth, it's a perfectly reasonable system, and it exists everywhere else, so I'm not frightened of it. Universal health care with an opt-out being basically universal health care that rich people pay more for and, and get a different level of care, is that? Sure. Even in Singapore, if you want a better hospital room, you don't get a better doctor or a better nurse, but they'll give you a better hospital room if you want to pay for it. Andrew has a question. Actually, it's... it's it's it, we have not picked an easy task. You've got 3.3 trillion or something like that spent on the healthcare system, and every dollar, just like in government, they, uh, every dollar has a, hits a constituency, has a defender, and, and uh, uh, I do think it's so important that it should be tried. And when what I would tell our managers, and I've told our managers that we will never, we will not be coming up with something that hurts them in terms of the care they receive. Uh, and uh, uh, it's going. It, if we come up with any kind of a improved product, uh, I can guarantee you that I will like it. I won't have to, no one will have to stuff it down their throat. I mean, that would, and, and we will have people join us. But it is really an uphill climb, and and but we should be doing it. You you said over the weekend that you hope to have a CEO named for this new initiative between the three companies in the next couple of months. Yes, ha has it been narrowed down significantly? It's the been narrowed down to uh, yeah, a very few, and it's by far the most important decision we'll make. I mean, uh, there's no way, uh, and, it, and, and it, it's a, it, we've got plenty of people who want the job, but it is an extraordinarily difficult job because you have to be very you have to be plenty knowledgeable about enormously knowledgeable about the system, but you have to be able to get your mind beyond it, and 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 and, and you have to understand who you'll be, who your opponents will be. You have to understand public opinion. You have, and and, and you have to, you know, you could bargain down costs in some areas, one percent or two percent, but you, uh, we really hope we can find the, the perfect person in terms of of being able to make a real jump. I mean, as Charlie will tell you, there's, there, there's, there's some history in terms of what happened. When Rockefeller totally revolutionized American health care for the better, he went after the low-hanging fruit. He went after the charlatans and the quacks and so forth. And my guess is that Berkshire will find some low-hanging fruit. If you had to guess where that low-hanging fruit would oh, be. Oh, I know there's a lot of low-hanging. I don't want to say. Okay. It, we'll whisper it to our new CEO, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the new CEO, I realize that this is something that Todd Combs is heading it up, but given your expertise, Charlie and Bill, have you had any input into what should happen with this, who the new CEO should be? Well, Todd's uh, a great learner, and he and I have brainstormed about, you know, what healthcare looks like, not, but not specifically on, on who gets hired. You know, I think there's three things that are very separable. If Berkshire, you know, finds a way to optimize its health care costs versus the entire U.S. health care uh, system, and access versus cost are 
two different things. If you add access, uh, unless you're very careful, uh, like a, a universal coverage, it will actually drive up costs pretty dramatically. And when, potentially lower uh, standards or lower what access people get. Right, so when you know Vermont costed out what universal care would cost, even uh, the proponents were, were stunned at the, the cost. So the, we have to perform two miracles. We have to get better access in, in America and get the cost down. No. Probably a couple other miracles we need we don't even know about. <laughs> the, the goal is not to reduce Berkshire's costs. Right. Uh, and and, and uh, we will have a CEO, and I hope, I would expect within a couple of months. And uh, uh, we will need a remarkable individual. Uh, that person will have to... Uh, also have a number of remarkable people who wish to join the person. That's one of the things, you have to have somebody that does attract other talent and so right. on. And uh, so uh, nothing's going to happen fast, except I, we do want to get the CEO in place, obviously, but the, you're not going to turn the whole system upside down immediately. But you want somebody that thinks about where you want to be in five years and figures out some path. I mean, obviously, getting. the person has to be an expert in health care, but from which arena? Because whatever yeah, arena well, they're coming sure. from becomes... Yeah, if you, if, you, if you talk to somebody who's run a hospital for 20 years, yeah. they think everything but the hospital is a problem, you know? Right. And if you talk to them, I mean, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit more broadly about some of the issues that we're seeing today. Earlier, we spoke with Warren about uh, trade issues, particularly with China, with our delegation just coming back from China. But trade has been a big issue when it comes to NAFTA, when it comes to our trade agreements around the world. And uh, the strategy from the Trump administration has been a little different than what we've seen from previous administrations. Maybe now we're going to find out if it works or not. We're at that point. Um, Charlie, what do you think about whether or not we're going to wind up in trade wars or whether you think we get better trade agreements as a result? I'm pretty optimistic about China and the United States working together. It would be insane for them not to work together and not to develop a trusting, co constructive relationship. And I have no reason to think that that won't happen. Bill? I agree, although I would say the U.S. is making that a bit challenging right at the moment uh, in terms of predictability and stability and finding the, the right approach. Um, you know, we're all big believers in the large benefits of trade. Um, and so the fact that the sentiments have turned against it, you know, do you need to do more uh, to help those who aren't hurt by trade? And politically, it's, it's impressive that free trade was not supported by either candidate. You mean in the U.S. election? Exactly. Right. Um, it, it may be the blowback after what happened in 2008 and 2009. Um, people who felt like they got left behind and who haven't caught up uh, with others. I, I'm not sure how else to handle that, what, what the right way about going to do that would have been. But, Bill, you're, you're somebody who has to go from nation to nation, country to country, and through the foundation and your work there, kind of hope that everyone can work together. Has it gotten tougher to do that, or is it the same as it was before? Well, the most important relationship in the world is between the United States and China. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine lots of win-win uh, things uh, with trade, with innovation, with uh, helping to drive stability for the world. We're countries with very different histories, very different governments. And so you do worry as you watch, uh, even in these last few months, the sparks fly. Uh, but I think logic will prevail. Uh, our foundation uh, has worked a lot with the Chinese government. Uh, you know, we're excited they're becoming a, a bigger aid donor. Um, so even for the work we do to help poor countries, this having this relationship be strong would be very, very helpful. Bill and Melinda as well have actually done very big and important things in terms of getting countries to work together in the health field. And uh, 
they have brought the world closer together in terms of attacking particularly vaccine, but a, a, a number of things to do with health. And, and over time, uh, that sort of thing will prevail in the world. I mean, when people see something working and their lives getting better, and you mentioned the problem of the prosperity, I mean, the, if countries get far more prosperous, they should figure out a way that all of their citizenry participate in some way. You want to keep the market system and it does wonders and all of that. But you, you have seen what you can, you can actually look at what Bill and Melinda have done, and they have influenced other countries to act cooperatively, and it's, it's a tremendous achievement. You all have been incredibly philanthropic. You've given uh, billions and billions of dollars away. But if you had to look and try and find one arena, one topic, one place that you think gets underserved, aside from what you're already doing with your own money, with the foundation money, is there an area where you would look and say, hey, here's another thing that needs some additional funding, it's overlooked, and it's very deserving? Bill, what do you think? Well, there's so many important causes out there, and we picked global health and education, uh, and by sort of specializing in those, you can do a good job. But uh, the, the needs are... are really vast. Uh, some philanthropists are working in the U.S. justice system uh, to deal with the inequities there. Uh, we do some work on poverty, but there's many others uh, who have different cuts on that. Uh, you know, the beauty of philanthropy is you're taking on, uh, you know, these social uh, goals uh, that are very, very difficult to achieve and trying to show government how to do uh, a better job, and so it's it's been rewarding. There's there's a lot of progress, but there's so many causes. And uh, as Warren and I encourage other people to do philanthropy, you know, we hope they'll pick uh, one of these unmet areas and get a passion for it and bring their same skills they had in business, uh, because that's that's huge value added even beyond the money. You're talking about through the giving pledge, where you it, through ideally through the giving pledge. I mean, we sit and talk with people about philanthropy, uh, and most of those people do end up uh, joining the pledge. Charlie, how about you? What what areas? Well, would better you drugs and devices ha ha have the advantage; they work almost automatically. Mm -hmm. And the one I see that will change the world is the new IUD is a huge contribution to human civilization. And it's just sweeping. It's, it, and it's going to change. That's going to change life. And the beauty of that, it didn't require any government, it didn't require any pompous bureaucracy. So they just invented a better way of doing it, and it spreads automatically. Well, I love that kind of thing. And of course, I like the vaccinations. Think of the good that it does to do the vaccinations. And of course, if you vaccinate and I don't, it doesn't work as well. So naturally, the nations cooperate. But Bill's going to get more cooperation than Warren is. Because? <laughs> He's, there's more incentive for the people to be, agree with Bill. Warren's taking on entrenched interests who aren't going to like it at all. Bill, very quickly, before we go to Warren on this, um, can you give us an update on where polio stands right now, just speaking of these vaccinations? Well, we have two countries that we haven't gotten rid of polio in. It's uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, we're making sure it doesn't travel to other parts of the world, so we have to keep the vaccination rates up. Uh, and uh, we're doing a better job getting out to all the children in those two countries. So with luck, this could be the last year with cases. Uh, but it's very tough. Uh, you know, it's every morning I get up and see, okay, what are, does the case count look like? And we actually sample the sewage to see if there's any... Uh, polio being transmitted. So we're very close, but zero's a magic number. If you miss it, then you, know, you have to go another year. Uh, so we've, we've got our fingers crossed. The reason that you sample sewer uh, samples is because... It... Amazingly, if a kid has polio and they're in that city, if you go look in the sewage, there, there's so many viruses uh, out of even a single kid that we can detect it. And we can see which virus it's like, and so we can understand where it came from. Uh, so that's actually our best tool, is that 
uh, we politely say environmental sampling. <laughs> you can see why I delegate philanthropy. <laughs> I, I, I urge to sample sewage is not We're back, back I've gotten 87 urge. without any, ur <laughs> any urge to sample sewage. <laughs> Bill gets excited about but it. Bill Gates has a, has a huge advantage. Nobody's in favor of infinite paralysis. And a lot of people are in favor of medical practice that's counterproductive. Although it, it, it's not a slam dunk for the vaccinations. You've had trouble uh, with some cultures who don't like you coming in there and some vaccination workers who have gotten into big trouble, too. Well, you get rumors about vaccines, yeah. uh, even in the U.S., um, that is this good for the child? If you have a child that gets a fever afterwards, people worry about that. So you have to constantly remind people of how beneficial it is and uh, every once in a while when you coverage rates go down, then you'll get lots of measles uh, or pertussis uh, coming in. So uh, it, people who understand really want these things, and the, the progress has been phenomenal. Uh, but we have to create demand as well as supply to meet our goals. Warren, I want to come back to you just in terms of finding a cause that you think is important that you maybe hope somebody else will, will spend some time on. Well, I think the number one problem of mankind is weapons of mass destruction. I mean, we have learned since 1945 uh, how somebody with bad intent or some organization with bad intent or occasionally some government with bad intent, uh, the knowledge is there of how to, to kill millions of people and, and, and uh, uh, and in some cases, the intent might be there. The materials have been hard in the case of nuclear to some extent, and now you've added cyber to the equation. So that's the not, I consider that the number one problem of mankind. I'm, I don't know how to use money to fight it, uh, particularly. And uh, uh, but then I believe in 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 women having the right to decide uh, uh, what to do with their bodies, and 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 that's been. Uh, advanced very considerably, but there's, there's still a lot of work to be done there. But uh, uh, I believe the number one problem to get beyond weapons of mass destruction in the United States is to figure out how to maintain all the benefits of a market system, which, which works wondrously in creating more output all of the time, and 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 at the same time make sure that people that are really don't fit a market system very well, still leave dec live decent lives. And, and we've got the resources to do it. And, and we've made a lot of progress on that. Social Security was progress. I mean, we, we take better care of our young and old, but we don't, we haven't figured out the way to take some very good care of somebody that just doesn't fit into the market system, but's a perfectly decent citizen. And a rich society should, should, should uh, solve that one. Andrew has a question as well. Warren knows more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll ask you guys a question that I was surprised didn't come up this weekend. Uh, you all are voracious readers, and um, generally somebody will ask you guys at the, at the annual meeting what you've been reading recently. Uh, let me just toss that out. Uh, Bill, you constantly have a list of what you've been reading. How, what, what, what makes it this year? Well, the, the top would be this new Hans Rosing book called Factfulness. Uh, it's very readable. Uh, talks about how the world has changed, and Hans shares how he had some misperceptions that he didn't see all the progress. And I talked to you about how to how to think about uh, news and where we're going. Uh, so that's that's brilliant. Charlie. Well, I read a book by a Chinese. A economist who had worked in the World Bank. And his general idea was that we had learned better how to help a poor nation develop. There was a lot of stupidity in the early days when we'd give some very poor and backward nation a big steel plant, and of course it wouldn't work. And, and I think this economist was right. So I think, generally speaking, uh, there's a lot that's right in the world. Mm -hmm. Warren, have you been reading anything lately that's caught your attention? Well, yeah, I, but I, I narrowed it down a little bit more. I've always recommended Chapter 8, you know, of The Intelligent Investor, and which stays up there among the top sellers uh, for years. But so 
in that same spirit, I would re re recommend reading chapter four of uh, Steven Pinker's new uh, uh, book. And, and, uh, and there's some very interesting reasons to be optimistic about the world in, 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 in that chapter. What, what does it focus in on? Yeah. yeah. Tell them the name of the book, it's Bill. It's called Progressophobia is the chapter name, and the book is called Enlightenment Now. Mm. Uh, it's another book, like the Rawlsing book, that talks about the progress we've made and how we could learn from the places we've made even faster progress. It came out of the work he did in his previous book, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, where he saw that violence was going down, and now he's looked at a lot of other things, uh, like workplace safety and happiness and... Uh, it's, it's a more serious read uh, than a lot of books, but really fantastic. We, we've uh, spoken a little bit with Charlie and Warren about what they've learned from each other. I'll ask each of you, as we're wrapping up this hour, what you've learned from Berkshire, uh, broadly, as board members, uh, as uh, people who travel together, who work together, who have fun together, and spend time to, together. Um, just what it's meant over the years. Uh, Bill, I'll go ahead and start with you because you haven't gotten to weigh in on this yet. Uh, something you've learned from uh, Charlie and or Warren and, and the, the board at large. Well, from Warren, the whole approach to thinking logically, uh, thinking long term, uh, it's been an incredible education and totally shaped how uh, I think about things. The fact that then there's this incredible set of people, including Charlie and the managers that I've gotten exposed to, uh, we have in our second board meeting a bunch of man the managers come in and talk about their businesses. And it's one of the most fun times of the year to hear about very different businesses and the competitive dynamics and how technology affects them and how a system where you have these great long-term thinkers with very high integrity who are dealing with these uh, challenges. So. You know, my whole business education uh, started the day I met Warren, and uh, the Berkshire team has, has helped keep it going at full speed. Warren? Well, it's very important in life to associate with people who are better than you are. And it's the most important decision. I, I, you will go in the direction of the people that you associate with, and you'll get ideas from them, and you'll see how their behavior works and all of that sort of thing. And the most important decision, usually in that respect, uh, is, is your spouse. Uh, but it's enormously important among your friends to have people that you admire as well as have a lot of fun with, and, and you will move in the direction of their better behavior. And, and uh, uh, with both uh, uh, Bill and Charlie, I've, I've learned a lot. I've had an enormous amount of fun. Uh, but I pick up on their ideas. And, and, uh, and that's been a very good thing. Charlie, I'd like to have you have the last word today on that topic. Well, I said to the Berkshire managers this year as I looked out over the crowd, the nice thing about this room is that we would all feel pretty safe just delivering our children to almost anybody <laughs> selected at random from the group. You couldn't say that at most places. I just say there's a horse race for power and prominence or something or other. So we have a very admirable bunch of people. And we have less bureaucracy than almost anybody. And so that is not a small achievement. I don't think of a single, I can't think of a single company of our size that has less bureaucracy than we do. Did you set out to do that at the beginning? Well, we always hated bureaucracy. <laughs> and so I would say in a sense, yes. Wouldn't you say, Warren? Yeah, absolutely. No, we, we, we both... We both hated it. And we had the ability, or, you know, we're fortunate, we could create the company to some extent that we wanted to have. And I've always said it was crazy to be a painter painting something at the end you didn't... is not the painting you wanted to have. And Berkshire is a sort of painting. And we, have ha we haven't walked into some huge organization and had to claw through the progressions and the politics that went... And... Uh, and we have created what we want to create. Well, I don't think we could fix a big bureaucracy. No, we couldn't. No. We, we could create something that didn't become a big bureaucracy, but we, we couldn't fix one no. that's already bureaucratic. 
Charlie, Warren, Bill, I want to thank all three of you for your time today. We truly appreciate it.